Two years ago, the Royal Academy mounted a huge survey of British art in the 20th century. It basically claimed that the best British art was produced by artists heavily influenced by the latest modern art fashions on the continent, by Picasso, Matisse, etc. But according to a show that opens at the Barbican tomorrow, called The Last Romantics, there was another, more important school of British art at work at the same time, which deliberately ignored these foreign modernists and looked back instead at the good old English pre-Raphaelites of the 19th century, just as the pre-Raphaelites themselves had looked back at the art of the Middle Ages. So who were these forgotten last romantics? And were they any good? A report from the editor of Modern Painters, Peter Fuller. This exhibition takes a quite different view of British art from that which was put forward in the Royal Academy's big show two years or so ago. There are about 500 paintings, drawings, sculptures, books in this show, and all of them owe something to pre-Raphaelitism. Most of them were made in quite self-conscious opposition to the modern European movements in art. Clive Bell, one of the Bloomsbury critics, once said that pre-Raphaelitism was a movement of utter insignificance in the history of European painting. But John Christian, who put together this exhibition, is trying to show that for better or for worse, pre-Raphaelitism persisted in British painting in the 20th century. By the late 19th century, Burne Jones was a grand old man of the pre-Raphaelite movement. He painted this picture, Vespertina Chies, in 1893. As so often with Burne Jones, the precise subject matter isn't at all clear. The picture has vague echoes of the Mona Lisa, of Arthurian and Celtic themes. But a contemporary critic said about it enthusiastically that the woman's expression was indicative of that inner peace which belongs to a pure soul in harmony with itself. But George Moore, the great champion of Impressionism, was much less appreciative. He described Burne Jones as the worst artist who ever lived, whether you regard him as a colorist, a draftsman, a painter, or a designer. And this was pretty well the standard view of Burne Jones in the early part of our century, too. Critics who belonged to the modern movement once accused Burne Jones of not breaking with 19th century romanticism. But in recent years, there has been a big re-evaluation of his reputation, and what were once seen as his weaknesses are now regarded as his strengths. And I certainly feel that despite his languor, he was always trying to give us a spiritual vision, which is something more than what we can see with our eyes alone. Even so, it's hard not to sympathize with R.H. Walensky, an enthusiast for the modern movement in art, who wrote that Burne Jones's followers were even more addled in mind than he was himself. The work of many of them still looks pretty wacky today. This picture, Night with Her Train of Stars, by Edward Robert Hughes is actually one of the better examples of a painting by a Burne Jones follower in this show. It is an allegory of death, possibly a comment on infant mortality. The poppies are symbols of oblivion. The picture was painted in 1912. That's about the same time that Kandinsky was becoming abstract in Munich. And oddly enough, this painting has something of the same feel of Kandinsky just before his figures disappeared. Much harder to take, to my mind, are big set pieces by late pre-Raphaelites who joined the Royal Academy. Take this stilted picture, Echo and Narcissus, which was painted by John Waterhouse in 1903. Here, we're a long way from Burne Jones. Spirituality has become banality. But before we laugh too much at pictures like this, it's as well to remember that The Lady of Shalott, another painting by Waterhouse, has long been one of the most popular pictures in the Tate Gallery. But not everything in this exhibition is so excruciating. 
I think this picture by Stanley Spencer must be the finest in the whole show. Spencer painted it in 1914, just two years after he'd left the Slade School. It's called Zacharias and Elizabeth. I think that in this picture, Spencer recaptured some of the authentic spirit of the pre-Raphaelitism of the 1850s. And for me, one of the most exciting things about this exhibition is that it shows us that an artist like Spencer wasn't just some sort of extraordinary freak or British eccentric. He too belonged to a tradition. There is an intense sense of place in this painting, springing from his love of the woods near Cookham where he lived. Somehow, he combines strangeness and mystery with an exhilarating freshness of feeling, unlike the followers of Burne Jones. It makes a lot of sense to see many of the best British artists from about this period, even a painter like David Bomberg, who became deeply involved with vorticism, as being as much romantics as they are moderns. And in that sense, I think this show really was worthwhile. John Christian, who organized this show, says that pictures like these illustrate the question of how an artist can represent religious, mythological, or literary themes in an age when time-honored iconographies are just breaking down. And in a sense, the rise of the modern movement allowed us to escape from this dilemma. But in today's postmodern cultural climate, it has come back to haunt us. And this may be one reason why there is such a striking similarity between pictures like, say, Harry Morley's neoclassical paintings of the 1920s and what so many postmodern neoclassical artists are producing today. The problem of the last romantics is still our problem today. How can you convey any sense of spiritual depth in painting when the shared symbolic order of a kind that a religion once provided has just disintegrated? In a way, it's comforting that the last romantics really had no better answer to this question than many of today's postmoderns. Even so, this exhibition does seem to me to raise important issues. It shows how many major figures in 20th century British art, figures like Stanley Spencer, Mark Gertler, whose gorgeous painting, The Creation of Eve, an English version of Gauguin, is one of the highlights of this show, or Paul Nash, who looked so hard at Rossetti. All of these painters seem to me to make much more sense if we think of them as romantics rather than moderns. Peter Fuller, I really think you've been extremely nice about an extremely bad show. There's so much awful art in this exhibition. Well, there is a lot of awful art in the, in the show, yes. And I mean, that is the trouble of many shows organized by art historians. They have this compulsion to push in all the junk they uncover in people's attics. But despite that, there are also some wonderful paintings and there is a new view of British art. What's that new view? I wasn't entirely clear about what you were saying. You, you mentioned the word spiritual several times. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, historically, it's more important than that. It's that, that there is a tradition that springs out of pre-Raphaelitism and the Romantic movement, which did not die out, which was not displaced by um, the modern movement, and that that had a continuing life and uh, some of our major painters, like Spencer and Nash, clearly belong to that and emerge out of it. Let's not have an art history lesson. Let's say, what is going on that you find so spiritual? Let's, let's get back to this word. What do you mean? I mean, they're just avoiding well, things, aren't they? Let's take a, a painter like Spencer. There is a quality about his work, which one doesn't get in a great deal of pictures in the modern movement, which has very much to do with his belief, his faith, and indeed his way of painting, and I personally respond to that very strongly. But what, what, what? He, he, he's painting about a god when there isn't a god, or what? Where is this spiritual well, I mean, element? He actually believed that there was, and there is, it seems to me that there's a certain sense in which maybe some kind of belief is necessary 
uh, to very uh, strong painting. And certainly Spencer had that belief. I mean, I personally don't share it, but I can see how it informs. Let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning of the show. I I think Spencer, unarguably, is obviously a great artist and and is certainly the most important thing Uh, in the show. But what about what about all that stuff at the beginning? Those endless damsels in distress, all those knights in shining armor. It's rubbish. Well. I mean, I think one of the saddest things about the show is that, for example, a major key figure like Burne Jones is so poorly shown. There were only a tiny number of paintings. And the the revaluation which has gone on of Burne Jones, the rediscovery of him as a major late 19th century painter, you don't really get much of a feel of that from that exhibition. And I would rather have seen a show that concentrated on the peaks. It went from Byrne Jones to Spencer with one or two things in between to Nash and maybe Gertler and, and showed us the late Nashes and brought out that rather than all this clutter. Am I, right, I, th- am I right in thinking, Peter, that what you like about this sort of work is the fact that it avoids all these terrible foreign influences of these awful modernists in Paris and actually pursues a true British course. Oh, no, I think that's absolute rubbish. I mean, I think that's that, what it sounds that like. Baudelaire, who was, after all, not English, yeah, he I put it very that. well. Yeah, he said that the, the particular quality of the British school was that it, it responded to the imagination and the precious faculties of the human soul. He said that was something that was inherent within the British tradition. And of course, mm-hmm. painters like Burne Jones were always looking overseas. They were very closely related to Puvis the Chavanis, and indeed they had an enormous reputation outside England. I, I don't know what the French word for twee is, but I'm sure Baudelaire might have used that as well. No, no, I, don't, I think Baudelaire had great admiration for, for, for many of the, the British painters. And I certainly don't find, say, Burne Jones a minor or a twee but or a Can we get away figure. just from Burne Jones for a minute and look at this show as a whole? What does it do? Is it a revisionist exhibition? If so, what is it telling us? It's revisionist in an in important sense, I think, in that it is saying that there is an indigenous tradition within Britain uh, which was in some sense displaced by by particularly the Bloomsbury critics at the beginning of the century, where they, they just dismissed pre raphaelitism and Clive Bell said it was um, you know, of no value whatever, utter, utter contempt he expressed for it. And it's quite clear that despite that kind of dismissal, um, this tradition had a life, and it, it was important for many painters that we think of as modern, and, and which were shown as modern. But say, a, apart in, from Spencer, are they any good, these painters? Well, I, mean, I thought they were parochial. Well, I mean, it, to, to say that, it's rather like saying, you know, how many Dutch painters were really very good, um, I- apart from Vermeer and a handful of others. Of course, there's a lot of uh, minor figures, but I mean, one would expect that in the recovery of a tradition. What I do regret is the way that art historians, having recovered it, will pack the galleries full of it. One needs perhaps critics more, or, or people with some imaginative and aesthetic response to the pictures to sort out what the... Uh, art historians dig out, and there I would agree with you. Perhaps all that stuff ought not to have been shown. On the surface, Peter, it seems to me that this is an extremely jingoistic exhibition. It's saying, here we have all these third-rate English artists. We think they're much better than the people who are influenced by the French, those terrible people at Bloomsbury. It's a very... No, 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 I think that's quite wrong. And I, I really, it seems that way. I don't think that John Christian, who organised the exhibition, is saying that the, the work that's being presented is, in that sense, better than... Or or, or anything, and I certainly don't see the jingoistic element, because as I've, I've said, uh, uh, many of those artists had very strong relationships with the symbolist school in France, and I think that one key thing is that many of them resemble, say, a painter like Gauguin, who's been so marvelously shown at, uh, in Paris at the moment. They resemble him in the sense that we often look back on him as a modern Peter, painter. Peter, are there any Gauguins in this show, well, undiscovered Gauguins I mean, found here? No, not, not a quite that stature, but I mean, getting on that way, Mark Gertler, it seems to me, is an extremely beautiful, mm. that painting by him. I, um, I found it, I, we have to finish, unfortunately, I found it an enormous disappointment. I'm sure it'll be very popular, as the pre-Raphaelite show was earlier on at the Tate Gallery. Anyway, thank you, Peter Fuller. 29-year-old Cleveland Watkiss is Britain's finest jazz scat singer. According to legend, scat started when black music hall performers forgot the words to popular songs and improvised. Taken up by Louis Armstrong, Cab Calloway and Ella Fitzgerald, it soon developed its own distinct musical identity. 
Cleveland Watkiss, winner of Wire Magazine's Best Vocalist Award for the past two years, continues this tradition. Good night. Get the boop boogie, bed the boop boogie, bed